Number 1. The girl in the green Mac is the name given to Sheila Fox, a six-year-old from Bolton who went missing on her way home from school on Friday, 18 August 1944. At the time very little attention was made of the disappearance, outside of immediate family and the local community, due to war coverage. The German 7th Army retreated across the Orne River, leaving 18,000 men behind to be captured, and thus, this tragic and baffling tale was relegated to the back pages. It was only until after the war, in 1948, that Sheila's disappearance gained any sort of attention, when a tall, thin man was wanted for stabbing two children and people believed he may have been responsible for her too. Sadly, this baffling tale is still unsolved, and nobody has been brought to justice for her disappearance over 75 years ago, resulting in a lifetime of pain for her family. Here is the story of the mysterious disappearance and subsequent searches for the girl in the green Mac, life in 1944 for a child must have been hard. The war had been raging for five years, and although the air raids had slowly disappeared over the years, the threat of death hung on every corner. Add to this severe rationing and family members being killed on foreign lands, and as a child, the fear and anxiety must have been overpowering to say the very least. In August 1944, Sheila Fox was a happy, but shy little girl. At around 3 p.m. she was walking home from school, when eyewitnesses claimed to have seen her with a man in his mid-twenties. She was wearing a green Macintosh, and she was walking beside him near her home. After her disappearance, a rather contradictory and baffling picture was painted. Some people claimed to have seen her walking alongside the man, while others claim that she was riding on the handlebars of the man's bike. Whatever the story though, a man in his mid-twenties was always in there somewhere. One of the people who saw and knew Sheila shouted out to her and asked her where she was going, to which she replied with this man. As mentioned before, Sheila was a timid and shy girl, which made investigators at the time believe that she must have known the man whom she was seen with, if not a family friend then at least someone who had introduced himself to her previously. We now understand that this would indicate clear grooming behavior, but at the time, police were baffled. Sheila was never seen again. Police have never uncovered any evidence that she was abducted, never found a stitch of clothing and most importantly, never found a body. The girl's family had, understandably, an incredibly difficult time believing their girl to be murdered, and so they left their front door unlocked for years after, in the hope that she'd return home. Tragically, both parents died without knowing whatever happened to Sheila. 57 years passed without incident, until 2001, when an elderly man came forward to police with a story. A story that would renew interest in this still unsolved case. The unnamed man told police that when he was a schoolboy, all the way back in 1944, he was witness to his neighbor digging a large hole in his back garden under cover of night. The house in Farnworth in Bolton was once home to Richard Ryan, a convicted rapist who died back in 1995. Ryan was 20 years old in 1944 and was convicted of rape in 1950 and of the sexual assault of a child in the 1960s. His walk to and from work was down the street in which Sheila was last seen. However, after four days of excavating the back garden of Ryan's former home, no body was found and investigators concluded that no body had ever been buried under the flowers and rhubarb in the small suburban garden. What had the eyewitness seen, and was he just misremembering details from so long ago? Sadly the baffling case of the disappearance of the girl in the green Mac is still yet to be solved, and as time goes by, it seems increasingly unlikely that it ever will. Police are keen to point out that the case will remain open, and if anyone thinks they can help then they should call crime stoppers. Number 2. I cover a lot of cold cases, some of which have gone unsolved for decades. But I think this is the oldest case I've ever covered. In fact, I found out about it when I went in search of the oldest cold cases I could possibly find. Let's talk about Marvin Clark, who hasn't been seen or heard from in almost a century. Because this case is so old, some of the details are fuzzy. We do know he was born Marvin Alvin Clark, but even his birth date has been disputed. Some sources said he was born in 1857, others said 1851. We do know he married a woman named Mary, 
and had four children. Marvin had several different jobs throughout the course of his life. He was a farmer at one point, as well as a town marshal, once in Nebraska and later in Linton, Oregon. The word marshal has several different definitions. It can be used to describe the chief of police or of a fire department, a military officer, a court officer or several other things. However, another source said Clark was a retired sheriff, so I assume that's what it meant in his case. By 1926, Marvin and Mary Clark had settled in Tigard, Oregon, about 10 miles south of Portland. They'd lived there for about 15 years, and at least Marvin was pretty well known. He was either in his late 60s or early 70s, the time when a lot of people today would be preparing for retirement if they weren't there already. But this didn't seem to be in the cards for Marvin Clark. On October 30, 1926, Marvin left his home in Tigard and set off for Portland. Again, sources vary on exactly what his intentions were. Most said he took a stagecoach and went to visit his daughter, Sydney McDougall. Either the next day or two days later, his wife, Mary, contacted Sydney only to find out that not only had Marvin never arrived at his daughter's house, but Sydney had no idea he was even coming. Other sources give a different story, saying Marvin was going to the doctor and or actually traveled by bus. One source also said he disappeared in June, but I think this was an error. One genealogy website said his movements could be traced to the Yamil Street Terminal in Portland. I don't know exactly how all these details got jumbled up or what the real story is. But Marvin's doctor was reportedly in Portland, so I do wonder if some of these supposed contradictions are actually true at the time same. He could have gone to Portland for a doctor visit, but also planned to stay with his daughter overnight. Maybe he thought this would be easier than traveling the 10 miles back home the same day, which might have taken longer in 1926 than it would now. But, of course, that is just a guess. The search for Marvin started pretty quickly. His family and police actively looked for him, and police in all northwest cities were asked to keep an eye out. By November 11, a $100 reward had been set up for information that might lead to his whereabouts. But it was difficult to figure out just what happened to him. Early on, his family was afraid he'd been hurt or killed by someone he'd made enemies with during his time as marshal. There was also the possibility he'd left on his own, but unintentionally. In early November, Marvin's son, Grover, received a letter from his father. It was postmarked from Bellingham, Washington, over 200 miles away from Portland. Star. Whatever was in the letter, it led Grover and his wife to believe Marvin's mind wasn't what it used to be. Marvin also didn't take a coat with him when he set out, even though it was probably cold in Oregon at the end of October. Had something happened to him due to his mental state? Or had someone done something to him? Then, in 1986, a new theory surfaced. On May 10, loggers found a skeleton near Scapus, Oregon, about 20 miles north of Portland. Several items were found near the body, but the most notable here were an 1888 nickel and a 1919 penny. A corroded revolver was also found near the body, and the man who had died had a single gunshot wound through his skull. His death was ruled a suicide. A few days later, a woman named Dorothy Willoughby said the body might belong to her grandfather, Marvin Clark. Based on what she'd heard from family members, Marvin had been depressed due to health problems that left him partially paralyzed. She knew he hadn't been heard from in years, so it's easy to put the pieces together here and form this theory. The body was also found close to Linton, where Marvin used to serve as town marshal. Linton was later annexed by Portland as is now considered part of it. The medical examiner said the body appeared to be of a man younger than Marvin would have been when he went missing. But there didn't seem to be much progress on identification at the time, presumably because of a lack of modern technologies like DNA testing. Then, in 2004, Dr. Nissi Vance entered the picture. Vance was a forensic anthropologist at the Oregon State Medical Examiner's Office. I'm not sure if she still is. That year, she began looking through the office's unidentified remains. Around 2011, she came across the files both for Marvin Clark and the John Doe from 1986. Wondering if they were the same person, she sent a DNA profile from the John Doe to the Center for Human Identification at the University of North Texas. 
Don't ask me exactly how this works, but they were able to get a full DNA profile from this. Now investigators worked to get DNA for Marvin Clark. They went through genealogy databases and found some of his relatives from his paternal side who were able to provide DNA. Then they had to get DNA from his maternal side for as full of a profile as possible. However, about six months later, the remains were confirmed to not be those of Marvin Clark. So, is Marvin Clark's case the oldest active missing persons case in the United States? Several sources said it is. Another said it was one of the oldest. Others said something similar and listed a few older cases. Wikipedia says the oldest active case is that of Alice Corbett. Alice was a student at Smith College in Massachusetts and was last seen in her dorm on the morning of November 13, 1925. I know Wikipedia isn't the most reliable source and I couldn't find information on whether this case is still active, but I thought it was interesting enough to share. Another source said the oldest was that of Oljaya Cravens, who disappeared from Oklahoma in 1902. His case is still on NamUs, so I assume it's still active, but, of course, I could be wrong. Marvin Clark has been missing for 94 years and would be over 160 years old today. So investigators aren't hoping to find him alive, but I will give some details that might help in his case. Marvin Alvin Clark disappeared from Tigard, Oregon on Saturday, October 30, 1926, when he was between 69 and 75 years old. He was headed to Portland, presumably either to visit his daughter or his doctor. Marvin had either white or gray hair and blue eyes. He was about 5 feet 8 inches tall and 170 pounds. He was paralyzed on his right side, walked with a limp, and might have used a cane. He was last seen wearing a dark suit and hat. So that's all I have for you today on Marvin Clark. It kind of blows my mind that there are people out there who have been missing for this long. This case might be one of the oldest active ones, but there are a lot more inactive ones that are even older and will probably never be solved. I know that's kind of a depressing note to end on. But with newer technologies, I think there's hope that Marvin Clark's remains can be found someday and his descendants can have answers. Number 3. On December 7, 1996, crime author Eugene Izzy was discovered hanging 14 stories above Michigan Avenue in Chicago, Illinois. One end of the rope was tied around his neck and the other end was connected to his desk in his office. It appeared to be a suicide upon first glance, but investigators started to suspect foul play once they realized Izzy was wearing a bulletproof vest. In addition to the vest, he was also found with $481 in cash, brass knuckles, a can of disabling chemical spray, notes documenting recent threatening phone calls, and three computer discs containing his newest novel. Inside his office, on the floor, police found a fully loaded, unused .38 caliber pistol. Eugene Izzy was born on March 23, 1953. He was raised on the southeast side of Chicago by an alcoholic father who was in and out of prison for various crimes. In his teenage years, Izzy dropped out of high school and enlisted in the army. While serving, he managed to earn a high school equivalency degree. He would also begin writing during this time. Not exactly a typical suicide by any stretch of the imagination. After he was discharged, Izzy returned home and immediately started working at the local Illinois steel mills. This blue-collar lifestyle would directly affect his future publications. Despite having a wife and children, Izzy spent the majority of his off hours at the bar. Of course, this caused some tension in his household and he very nearly lost his family. Add in the extra bonus of the steel mills periodically laying him off, and one might wonder how anybody could maintain their sanity. Izzy, however, took these layoffs as a sign. He quit the drink and managed to reconcile with his family, and with the encouragement of his wife, he began taking writing more seriously. In the span of six years, he wrote six novels. Although, at first, none of them were accepted for publication. Izzy made his big break in 1987 when St. Martin's purchased his novel, The Take, for $20,000. He took advantage of his new success and increased his writing output, going on to publish more books soon afterward. Each new title brought a new spike in sales. To celebrate, Izzy moved his family into the suburbs of Chicago. 
He was making it, baby. He was going somewhere. Izzy's writing dealt with typical crime fiction themes. Most of his characters were tough motherfuckers caught up in the mob, just trying to make that stereotypical last score to get out of the business. But, thanks to his blue-collar upbringing, he made these stories his own. However, his success did not last long. The book that was supposed to be his big hit, Tribal Secrets, flopped. This was the book that was supposed to make him one of the greats, that was supposed to put him alongside writers like Elmore Leonard. Instead, it totally bombed, and to save face, the publisher was left with no option but to quickly discount the hell out of the price. Understandably, this pissed Izzy off. He got into an argument with his publisher over their decision, and, in the end, struck a deal, Izzy would be allowed to keep his advance money, only if he agreed not to publish a book under his own name for the next three years. Does that deal make any sort of sense? Well, no, not really. It seems like the publisher just wanted to be an asshole. With no other choice, Izzy took the deal and went on to publish three new novels under the pseudonym, Nick Gitano. Afterward, he went back to his regular name and charged toward a career comeback. All signs were pointing toward a rather successful career as a crime novelist, so it was a pretty big surprise when Izzy was discovered hanging from his writing office on December 7, 1996. Although he'd been on antidepressants and was seeing a therapist, the details of Izzy's death seemed curious enough to warrant further investigation. After all, why would somebody kill themselves while wearing a bulletproof vest or carrying brass knuckles and a can of mace? This was a man who hated public appearances, despised book signings. So why such a public display? Even stranger, police also discovered countless notes Izzy had documented of threatening phone calls he'd received. Apparently, Izzy had infiltrated an Indiana militia group to help research his current work and progress. Before his death, Izzy had approached a retired Chicago cop about these threats. He even let him listen to his voicemail. On it, a woman said he'd been found guilty and that he'd be dead by hanging by the end of the year. Which is, you know, exactly how Eugene Izzy died. But here's the weirdest goddamn detail about all of this, along with everything else. Police also found three computer disks containing his latest work and progress. An 800-page manuscript that included a scene of a Chicago mystery writer who, equipped with both mace and brass knuckles, is thrown from a 14th floor window with a noose around his neck. Who does the throwing? Well, Indiana militiamen, of course. Izzy took their threats seriously, as anybody should in this kind of situation. He moved his family to a safe location and started sleeping in his office with a gun nearby. He was scared out of his mind. What was he supposed to do? So he waited, and either the militiaman found him and threw him out the window, or he offed himself. Which one is it? The coroner eventually ruled his death a suicide, but goddamn, the details surrounding this case are just so weird. Maybe he was rolleplaying the scene in his book so the writing would feel more authentic. Maybe he was trying to create some unique publicity by dangling in front of downtown Chicago for a few minutes. Maybe militiamen got a hold of him. Or maybe he simply no longer wished to live and thought if he was going to go out, he might as well go out in style. Here's the truth, we won't ever know. We can speculate, sure. But there are no answers here. Just a mystery. A very strange mystery. Number 4. It's hardly surprising the mystery of the Lady of the Swamp would be of lasting interest to the late Harold David, Dave, Webster of Middle Tarwin. As a 12-year-old schoolboy, born and bred in the area, he joined the exhaustive search for the missing woman, Margaret Clement, towards the end of May 1952, but to no avail. As revealed by his oldest daughter, Jenny, at his funeral in the Meany and Dumbik football netball club rooms last Wednesday afternoon, Dave came back to the incident time and time again. One of his favorite tales was the mystery of the Lady of the Swamp, the disappearance of Margaret Clement, a wealthy heiress whose life fell into ruins and who lived in seclusion with her sister. After her sister's death, she lived as a hermit and would wade through the swamp and floodwaters surrounding her home Tullery for supplies. Dad and his father Harold joined the search for her after her disappearance in 1952, Dad taking a day off school for the search. 
Dad loved to talk about this mystery and his theories on who disposed of Margaret. A photo of a young Dave Webster with the other searchers was included in Richard Shear's famous book, The Lady of the Swamp, and displayed during a photo montage at the funeral. That was a different era, where regular floods and abundant surface water in the area were the bane of the local dairy farmer's existence, and much of the land still remained to be cleared of bush. The idea that stock, and indeed a local resident, might go missing for days wasn't out of the question. Born on November 8, 1939, the first and only son of Harold and Jean Webster, Dave's only sibling was Margaret, born in 1944, and with whom he was very close. He was named for both of his grandfathers, Harold Webster and David Brown, each of them sons of the district's pioneers, who had both died before he was born. He always lamented the fact he never got to know his grandfathers and as a result was always fascinated with the concept of being a grandfather. A keen student of history, Dave was particularly fascinated by his great-grandfather Cape Webster, who had arrived in Australia as a young man in the 1850s. A hard-working and entrepreneurial man, he did an enormous amount of surveying in the Victorian area and, in fact, surveyed the very land the Websters have farmed for four generations. David attended Middle Tarwin Primary School, which was founded in 1922, on land donated by his grandfathers. Sadly, the school closed in 1983, after several generations had attended the school, but it was a source of pride for Dave that he was able to negotiate the buying back of the land where son Gary's cows now graze. Academically strong at school, David set aside the encouragement of his teachers to go further with his studies and took up dairy farming, proving to be a very innovative operator, installing one of the first herringbone sheds in the district, extensively using the best AI genetics, and consistently topping the market with his pigs. The broad range of skills needed to be a successful farmer were acknowledged at the service by celebrant Pat Cunn in a poem called Just a Farmer by Ryan Goodman. Encouraged to attend a dance at the Dollar Hall in the late 1950s by great friend, the late John Mackey, he met and ultimately married Noreen Jones on July 9, 1960, delighted the pair shared a keen interest in sport. A useful footballer and a handy cricketer, Dave spent much of his spare time involved in sport, with a fair amount of success, later as an administrator, and with Noreen, taking great delight in the sporting achievements of their family of four, their partners and grandchildren. A fanatical Melbourne supporter, he witnessed most of the Demons' triumphs through the 50s and 60s, including their most recent win over Collingwood back in 1964. Mourners wore red and blue scarves as a tribute. A resident of Karuman House in recent times, Dave Webster passed away on July 26, 2021, leaving his loving wife of 61 years, Noreen, children Jenny, Gary, Carrie and Shane, their partners Chris, Lissolet, Jeremy and Lisa and grandchildren Daniel, Charlotte, Natasha, Gabriella, Annika, Alex, Eric, Riley and Ellie. He was buried with the Webster family in the Menian Cemetery, and a get-together followed at the Leangatha RSL.